There's what's being called a moment of reckoning happening. A reckoning not simply with white supremacy and the institutions that uphold it, but also with some of the foundational myths that underpin how we are made to understand this country. And while there is still a lot of uncertainty about what this moment will bring, if anything, it's allowed movements for justice to take center stage. One of these is the Land Back Movement, a movement for restorative justice and land reclamation for indigenous peoples. Now, you may be thinking, land reclamation? Like taking back this land, the one I'm paying excessive rent to live on? Kinda, except it's a little bit more complicated than that. And so I thought it would be good to bring in three indigenous activists to discuss what land reclamation is, what it looks like, and why the movement for justice for indigenous peoples isn't just necessary, but encompassing us all. what we are talking about we're talking about we are saying the return of land territories that are ours that are guaranteed under treaties that have been illegally taken by federal state and county governments and individual landowners it's everything that was also damaged and taken in the process it's not a new concept but it's it's newly being introduced through the process of land acknowledgments through an understanding that these lands were not empty, that they are lands that have always been stewarded and cared for by indigenous peoples. Land justice and land restoration looks like if you stole it, you should return it. We are not saying that everyone needs to leave. We're talking about shifting the decision-making power that was taken from our communities back into the hands of our people and, the, and of our communities. There is a way that we lived in, in balance and harmony with the land, not plowing through our sacred areas and sacred sites. If you look at you know, the history of the United States, Canada, Mexico, Puerto Rico, indigenous people today in this part of the world are living in most extreme poverty. We have the lowest social determinants of health and health outcomes. We have some of the lowest education outcomes for our systems. And th these things are systemic. This is generational poverty. I think that there's a lot of finger pointing that happens about why tribal communities are so poverty stricken or why there are the high rates of diabetes and other health issues. But, you know, it really needs to come into play of, of the holistic viewpoint of why it is that our communities are continuing to suffer and why it is that they are at such a disadvantage. Nationally, Native people have about 4% of our original land base. Um, that's, you know, the land we have left as reservations. And inside that, a lot of land we, we don't even hold inside our own reservations. And in a broader picture, Native people in the United States have about 50 million acres of land, but the federal government, just the Park Service alone, controls 80 million acres of land. There has been a system in place designed for not only the stilling of our lands, but the maintaining of the stilling of our lands, and that lands and indigenous peoples' actual sovereignty has been used as a natural resource. When you look at where nuclear waste is stored throughout America, it's stored on indigenous peoples' lands. When you look at where pipelines are being built throughout the nation, they're being built through indigenous people's land. There's an entire relationship with how corporate America and the policies that support it have actively been going after indigenous people and indigenous people's lands. The United States and Canada both have egregious practices to native people. I mean, you cannot say that the United States is worse than Canada. People who are focused on trying to tell a positive story of the way that Canada has dealt with Indigenous people are disconnected with the reality that Indigenous people in Canada are facing. If you were to ask our relatives up there, you know, that are, are constantly battling right out on the front lines, constantly being harassed by RCMP, they will tell you that they are not receiving any sort of, of better treatment. Canada discusses reconciliation, has a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but still over 100 nations have water advisories and you cannot even drink the water. Canada is a colonial government that continues to oppress Indigenous people today. The movement for healing and reconciliation, it stops short of actually providing justice and liberation for Indigenous people in Canada. So they make lip service in Canada, but the practice of Canada is genocidal towards the Native people, as it is in the United States. 
We're everyday warriors that are just standing up for our people and our community. And we don't deserve to be attacked by the military. We don't deserve to be attacked by the police. We don't deserve to be over-criminalized by a system in the name of justice. And I should not be facing 16 and a half to 17 years in prison for standing up on something that even the Supreme Court said was stolen lands. That is egregious. Indigenous people represent about 4% of the population of the, of the world, but we um, are the people who protect about 80% of the world's biodiversity. Land restoration is also about protecting and acknowledging the biodiversity of Mother Earth and the need to have those lands protected. And Indigenous people are obviously the best stewards. There's just a long line of Indigenous people who've had enough. A long line of Indigenous people who are tired of our people being beaten, our land stole, tired of the suffering of indigenous people. Protection and recognition of our rights to land, control you know, of our economy, religious freedom, language restoration. Defund the military industrial complex that was used for the stealing of indigenous people's lands and the over-policing of our people today. Dismantle the system of white supremacy that was created in the first place for the stealing of our lands, whether that be the dismantling of certain parts of the court system, certain parts of bureaus of land management that not only played the role of stealing our lands, but maintain the theft of them and then the actual physical returning of public lands. The only compensation for land is land, and there's not a amount of payment, as evidenced in the Black Hills case, where the Lakota were offered $106 million for their land, and they rejected the settlement, which is now worth billions. Money is not the answer. The answer is land. There is a role for everybody in the land back movement that we're building. For the white folks out there who think that we're a bunch of Indians wanting to storm the mountains and burn a lot of your cabins, that's not what we're trying to do. The Land Back movement is about building collective power and collective liberation and building a world that works for everybody. Work there with us, work side by side with us to dismantle imperialism, colonialism, and a system of white supremacy and racial injustice. So, you know, collaborate with us, be our relatives, be our co-conspirators, be our accomplices for dismantling um, these systems. Um, don't be uh, scared of us for dismantling them. Thanks so much for watching this conversation. It's worth noting that we've seen some good steps in recent years. In October 2019, the city of Eureka in California voted to give back ownership of more than 200 acres of land to the Wyot tribe. Then there was July 2020 Supreme Court decision to rule much of Eastern Oklahoma native territory. Land reclamation can be complicated in practice, but it's not impossible and it's as critical to environmental conservation as it is to enacting justice for indigenous communities. Don't forget to like this video, hit subscribe, and let us know in the comments what are some other conversations and maybe slightly controversial topics that you want us to cover. We'll see you soon.